Hello everyone, today's story is on Barbara Graham, who was the third woman in the state of California to be executed by gas. Barbara was born on June 26, 1923 in Oakland, California. Her mother Hortense was an immigrant from Portugal and lived her life as a teenage prostitute. In 1925, Hortense gave birth to a girl named Claire, and in 1930, a son named Joseph. The father of the two children died in 1930 when Joseph was born. When Barbara was two years old, her mother got busted for prostituting, and since she was underage, she was sent to a reform school for girls. Barbara was said to have been raised by strangers and extended family members. She was very intelligent, but lacked formal education. As a teenager, Barbara was homeless and made a living begging for money and lived in the streets. She was eventually arrested because she looked and was later found out to have been underage. She was sentenced and served her time at the Ventura State School for Girls, which was the same exact school her mother was sent to. In 1939, at the age of 16, Barbara was released from the reform school and attempted to start a new life. She began dating a U.S. Coast Guard by the name of Harry Kilhomer in 1939, and by 1940 they married, even though she was still underage. Barbara had two children with Harry, and in 1942, at the age of 19, they divorced. It has not been mentioned why, but Harry was able to get custody of both children. Within the next few years, she married two more times, but each marriage ended in a divorce. Things were not going well for Barbara, and it was just one bad event after another, and she ended up giving up on relationships and honest work. She began prostituting, just like her mother did, and there's an old term called seagulls or seagull circles, and it was when a group of prostitutes hung out near naval bases. This is what Barbara used to do and would frequent the Oakland Army Base, Oakland Naval Supply Depot, and the Alameda Air Station. Barbara was arrested a few times for her sex work, and it was reported she had one arrest in 1942, which crosses timelines of when she was with her first husband. So she was most likely prostituting while married to all of her husbands. At the age of 22, she began working in San Francisco in a brothel. She was well liked because of her red hair and sex appeal. Her brothel madam was Sally Stanford, and her real name was Mabel Bubsy. Barbara continued her downward spiral and got involved with drugs, gambling, and making friends with criminals and ex-convicts. She once served a five-year prison sentence at California Women's State Prison for lying under oath when she testified as a false witness for her ex-convict friend. After serving her time for perjury, she moved to Nevada and then back to Southern California. She ended up moving to Hollywood Boulevard and began prostituting again. In 1953, at the age of 30, Barbara married a man named Henry Graham. She met Henry at a bar she used to work at, which was also where she met most of her Johns. He was an addict and also a known criminal. Despite her work, Barbara and Henry had a baby named Tommy together. It was actually because of Henry, Barbara met his two friends, Jack Santo and Emmett Perkins. Barbara began to have an affair with Emmett, and he ended up telling Barbara about a 64-year-old widow named Mabel Monahan, who was known for keeping large amounts of cash and jewelry in her Burbank, California home. Mabel's nephew worked in Vegas at casinos, and Barbara assumed he and Mabel were laundering money from the gambling tables. On the evening of March 9, 1953, Barbara... Perkins, Santo, and a couple of other men went to Mabel's home in order to rob it. Barbara was able to get inside by asking Mabel if she could use her phone. Once Barbara was inside, the other men barged in while one waited outside to be the lookout. Once the men got inside, they all continuously demanded from Mabel to show them where the jewels and money were. No matter what, Mabel refused to give or show them anything. Because of Mabel's continued refusal, Barbara began to beat her viciously with a pistol which ended up cracking Mabel's skull. After nearly beating Mabel to death, Barbara then suffocated her with a pillow. After the murder, one of the men who was at the scene of the crime, Baxter Shorter, ran to the nearest gas station and found a payphone to call the operator. 
Baxter gave the operator the address, 1718 Parkside Drive, and then immediately hung up before being asked any pressing questions. The operators tried to send help to that address, but it did not exist in Los Angeles. Baxter forgot to mention the city was in Burbank. Mabel's body was not found until two days later when Mabel's gardener came to pick up his paycheck and saw the bloody mess. The robbery was a complete fail and they all left with absolutely nothing. At a later date, they all found out that Mabel had over $15,000 in jewelry and valuables right near Mabel's dead body and was stashed in her purse. Baxter Shorter was arrested a little while later on a different charge. When he got caught for his new crime, he started telling investigators everything about the robbery and murder of Mabel Monahan. Somehow, Baxter's statement was released and he got kidnapped by Perkins and Santo and after kidnapping Baxter, they murdered him. Pictured here is Baxter's wife who witnessed the kidnapping and was able to identify Perkins and Santo as the ones who did it. Cops found the car Baxter was kidnapped in and it was the same location Perkins, Santo, and Barbara were apprehended. Their car was also registered under Santo's girlfriend's name. Baxter's body was never found and they legally declared him dead in 1960. In court, Barbara continuously expressed her innocence. There were a few witnesses testifying against her and all witnesses were testifying for immunity. Barbara also had no alibi and shot herself in the foot by paying a fellow inmate $25,000 for her friend to give a false alibi on her behalf. The inmate who told her about this friend was really a police officer and the inmate was working to reduce her sentence. The inmate ultimately got released from prison immediately and her sentence was changed to time served. During trial, when they questioned Barbara on her actions, it's been reported that she made these statements. Oh, have you ever been desperate? Do you know what it means to not know what to do? Barbara was convicted and sentenced to death row along with Santo and Perkins. In court, Barbara cried out, I am innocent of this crime. I swear to God, I am innocent. I hope my baby drops dead if I did it. On June 2nd, 1955, Barbara had a last meal of a milkshake and a hot fudge sundae. She was scheduled to be executed at 10 a.m., but wasn't strapped in until 11.30 due to her lawyer trying to stop the execution from happening. Within that hour, the governor called four times, either saying the execution was a go or to hold off. Each time that happened, Barbara would cry out and even collapsed once. While being strapped in, Barbara begged for a blindfold and was given a sleep mask. She has been the only person to ever ask for a blindfold during a gas chamber execution. She was advised by a guard to take a deep breath in after the cyanide pellets were dropped into the chamber because it would make her death easier, and she replied by saying, How the hell would you know, you silly rascal? Barbara's last words were, Good people are always so sure that they are right. She was pronounced dead 10 minutes later at around 11.40 a.m. Santo and Perkins were also executed that same day. And now for discussion and question time. Despite whether or not she was the actual killer, she did nothing to contact authorities like Baxter did and was still hanging around Santo and Perkins after the murder, so she had no qualms with them and was okay with still being in their presence. So they later learned that all of Mabel's valuables were in her purse that was right next to her. Do you think that they were on something during the night of the murder? Because as a thief, I think a purse would be one of the first things that you would look into. If she was innocent, why in court would she say, have you ever been desperate? Do you know what it means not to know what to do? That just makes me feel that she was at the scene of the crime and felt that she needed to do what she had to do, which makes her guilty.